I believe I do my best work under pressure. When I was a little girl, having the opportunity to go to school like this seemed impossible. I wanted to go so badly because I was eager to start a new life full of learning. My name is Nada. My name is Raz. My name is Durhan. When I got my acceptance letter, I couldn't believe I was one of 120 students chosen from all of Egypt. My father didn't agree at the beginning. He thought girls shouldn't study at boarding schools. Every night at dinner for two months, I told my father that I am going to go to the school. He said, no nada, you are not. It was not a normal thing in my family for girls to live away from home. They did not believe that I could stand alone. I challenged myself and succeeded. I'm studying to become a mechanical engineer, a computer scientist, a nuclear physicist. There is no such thing as a monster. My laptop is my weapon. My 3D printer is my right hand. My microscope is my window to the world. Sometimes it's hard because we face a lot of obstacles. But there is a difference between difficult and impossible. Being a girl is not an excuse. This is a turning point in my life. I believe that if I don't believe in myself, no one else will. Today, I'm a student. Tomorrow, I will be a woman who will change the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Engaging Generation Now. Moderated by Dana J. Hyde, Chief Executive Officer of the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, I am delighted to be here, even more excited for the conversation that will unfold around Generation Now. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of Generation Now? So I may be biased, but we have saved the best for after lunch. Uh -huh. Um, <clears throat> so some people call it the youth bulge, other call it the demographic dividend. With 60% of Africans, 65% of Southeast Asians under the age of 35, large youth populations across Africa, across Asia, across Latin America, the youth bulge is a reality and it is a tremendous opportunity. So to seize this opportunity, the United States has dramatically expanded its work with young people in developing countries. Through President Obama's Young African Leadership Initiative, or YALI, the US has connected more than 250,000 change makers, including 25 YALI Mandela Washington Fellows who are with us today from Howard University. Can we hear from them? <laughs> that, that is awesome. Uh, the success of YALI has sparked other young leader initiatives in Southeast Asia, in the Americas, and across the Atlantic in Europe. So this administration is also specifically focused on building a brighter future for adolescent girls. We live in a world in which 62 million girls are not in school. So in 2015, the president and the first lady launched Let Girls Learn to overcome these challenges and prevent, that prevent girls from attaining a quality education. And we'll hear more about that today. Building on that effort, the State Department, USAID, Peace Corps, and MCC have also recently launched an adolescent girls strategy that will help empower girls and help girls reach their full potential. Finally, we know that tapping the energy and the ideas of this inspiring generation will be critical in the fight to end poverty, 
That is why the U.S. has expanded opportunities for young entrepreneurs to turn their ideas into reality. And we have a dynamic example of that with us today. So in short, we know that partnering and supporting young people is not just inspiring to all of us. Uh, it's not just the right thing to do. It is smart development. Indeed, MCC's own research has shown that the absence of job skills, especially among young people, is one of the top constraints to growth in more than a third of our partner countries. By working with the young population, it's our best hope to advance economic growth, to make us safer, to promote human rights, and especially good governance, all themes that we've heard quite a bit about this morning. We are delighted to have a really impressive group with us today, but before we get started on this discussion, I want to turn it over to three young people who embody the promise of Generation Now. Over to you, Mara. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marwa Moaz. I'm an Egyptian American. I was born to immigrant um, parents from Egypt at NYU Hospital. When I was born, I was born with my hands and eyes wide open. The doctor told my mom she's going to be a strong girl. <laughs> when I got off the phone with the White House, I ran downstairs to tell my dad, and I said, Dad, I just got off the phone with the White House, and I'm going to be on this panel. My dad smiled and told me to make him a cup of tea. <laughs> Arab parents are very hard to impress. <laughs> I am the co-founder of Bamyan Media, which is a social enterprise that produces entertaining and educational TV designed to have a social <coughs> impact. Our mission is to tell transformational stories that en enable our generation to build a future of radical possibility. In high school, I was a basketball player, and I was MVP three years in a row. And I had an accident and was rushed to NYU Hospital. At the very same hospital that I was born in, doctors told me I wouldn't be able to, ch to move my right hand. But I was determined to try. My dad told me a story. He always used to tell me stories about Egypt and Islam, so I never forgot my roots. And one of the stories began with a quote from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Whoever of you sees an evil in this world, you must change it with your hand. And if you are unable to do so, then you must change it with your tongue. And if you are unable to do so, then you must change it with your heart. I was determined to try to move my hand. In three months, I was wiggling my fingers. In nine months, I was palming the basketball. And in 12 months, I was back on the court. At graduation, I was addressed as retired, number three, Marwa Moaz. <laughs> Everyone has a point in their life that changes them. Never let anything get in the way of your dreams. It was my dream to make this world a better place that gave me hope. And hope is such a powerful feeling. When President Obama got elected, I moved to Egypt. I thought this is my opportunity to try to make the world a better place. I started working on public health programs in Egypt, and I would often conduct household visits. What shocked me is when I entered these homes, I would see that they didn't have an oven, they didn't have a fridge, but they had a TV. TV penetration is at 98% in Egypt. The average Egyptian watches six hours of TV a day. That's as long as a school day, almost. But unfortunately, most TV programs aren't designed to have a social impact. In 2009, President Obama gave his new beginning speech in Cairo. He said he chose Cairo because in many ways it represents the heart of the Arab world. At that time, there was widespread injustice, police brutality, no freedom of speech, and we had one of the highest youth unemployment rates in the world. But people could not use their voice, and they could not do anything to oppose evil. But there was an unshakable feeling that this was about to change. The Arab Spring was not just a political awakening. It was also an entrepreneurial revolution. It gave Egyptians hope and the confidence 
that destiny could be shaped. That also gave me the courage to do something that I really believed in, and so I joined the founder of Bamiyan Media to start making television programs that have a social impact. In 2014, we launched a reality TV show about entrepreneurship in Egypt. It aired on the largest network in Egypt. Each episode was viewed by more than four million people. We had over a million social media followers. And the whole objective was to make entrepreneurs the new heroes of tomorrow, and to connect our viewers with the tools and resources they need to launch their business. We are now working on the Pan-Arab version, which will air from Morocco to Iraq. And we're also working on two new formats that tackle critical issues such as girls' education and women empowerment. Muhammad Ali said, champions are not made in the gym. Champions are made from something deep inside of them. A dream, a desire, a vision. They have to have last minute stamina. They have to be a little bit fast. They have to have the skill and the will. But the will must be stronger than the skill. I believe our generation is full of these heroes. And I believe that social entrepreneurs are going to be finding solutions to some of the most critical problems of our time. Thank you. Molueni, goeiemiddag, Dumelang, good afternoon. How does a young boy from the townships of South Africa have the privilege to address an audience of this caliber? My name is Chris Vuba, and I'm an urban planner from Cape Town, South Africa. I grew up on the other side of the tracks, like quite literally. Um, and I always knew there was a different world that existed on the other side of the tracks that had different people, different opportunities. And the realization was always that maybe if I build a bridge across the tracks, that my life, that of my family, that of my community, would be that much or so much better. Although not legally divided, I was faced with spatial segregation. And this was something that became a pending and continual question in my mind. And now today, I work for the government of South Africa as an urban planner. My focus on this spatial segregation that I grew up in um, led me to realize that what I was seeing was the physical manifestation of broader injustices and inequalities. I applied to the Mandela Washington Fellowship, Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative, to really better build these bridges, not only across the communities in my country, but across countries to connect with other leaders that were working to address these inequalities. Thankful to the US Department of State, and USAID, that I was able to connect with other young African leaders, and some of them are here with us today. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Being part of the Mandela Washington Fellowship um, gave me opportunity to connect with other leaders, to build these bridges, and really begin to see the potential that we had as a generation to change not only our communities, but our continent. And it's through the fellowship that I was able to meet other great young fellows that were doing great work. But being part of this uh, fellowship and the opportunities I was able to realize through it, two things really remained with me and were pivotal in my growth as a young African leader. One was being able to work with two young fellows. One is an artist, an entrepreneur, and uses people's homes in the townships of South Africa to display his art and use them as art galleries. The other one is a director of policy, of housing policy, in the government. Bringing these two together, we looked at spatial segregation, and right now we're reshaping South African housing policy that will institutionalize how homes can be better used as economic instruments for the beneficiaries and further drive investment as tourists are able to come into those communities and bring these two people from the other side of the tracks to meet at one central place. What happens when, when young people are invested in and they're given the opportunity to net, network amongst each other, 
they not only build bridges across communities, across sectors, and across geographic borders, but they are able to do more than that. And the, 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 the realities of that and the, and, and the, and the potential of that is, becomes exponential. And the, the investment in the, develop, the development innovation into that becomes unimaginable. I stand in front of you today, not only, no longer as a young leader on my own in Cape Town, doing urban planning, but as someone who's part of a greater network that is really rewriting Africa's stories. Like Patrice Lumumba said, that it'll be stories of, it'll be a history of dignity and glory. And as the African proverb has it, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. My name is Christiana Lang, and I am a returned Peace Corps volunteer. I served for 27 months in rural Thailand as a youth development specialist. And my work there ranged from teaching life skills, English, and occupational training, to more informal assignments such as how to sweat strategically and eat less white rice politely. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm here today to share how an American global initiative, Let Girls Learn, impacted my small village of 3,000 people and now goes on a year later in over 35 countries. Let Girls Learn was formalized in March 2015 by President Obama and the First Lady in conjunction with USAID, the State Department, Peace Corps, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. These groups came together in agreement that girls' access to school, health, and empowerment is necessary to realize sustainable development. Let Girls Learn seeks to eradicate the statistic that 62 million adolescent girls are not in school and aids local communities to assure their access to RISE. My best friend in Thailand was a 28-year-old special needs woman named Phone, or in English, Rain. She suffered an illness in high school that left her thought process slower, her body frail, but her wits completely intact. She was funny and brilliant, but was forced to drop out due to stigma and lack of support. Pphone is only one example of the many girls in my village and in the world who face barriers in culture, in health, and in poverty. Let Girls Learn is necessary because it provides opportunity for these girls to pursue their dreams. I introduced Let Girls Learn to my village through after-school programs and youth-led camps. Nationally, I facilitated annual workshops devoted to stop school-related gender-based violence. Now, in Thai, there's no word for gender. So to address that, the student-friendly schools curriculum provided new language, trained in mitigation tactics, and helped Peace Corps volunteers navigate how to continue supporting causes rather than being the ones to lead them. Now what resulted after the workshops were that the Thai educators were sharing what they learned. They were duplicating curriculum in staff meetings, in local health clinics, and in community elder gatherings. The entire village began to nurture those in the village who had previously been forgotten. And I couldn't help but think at that point that had these initiatives been in place beforehand, would Pphone's life be different? Now the beauty of Let Girls Learn is that it seeks to support not only girls, but boys, minorities, communities, and countries as a whole. By investing in youth, we perpetuate a cycle that cultivates new ideas. Young people are our greatest resource. We cannot find solutions in words already used, nor hope for change in the world when people are left without 
being invited into the process. As the panelists have said all day, all morning, and the panelists here behind me have said, I've learned in service as well that our, our world is better when we are brave enough to see ourselves and each other as important, equal, and interconnected. Thank you. So I was right, wasn't I? Didn't we save the best for just after lunch? Um, how truly inspiring uh, to bring us to this conversation today, and how delighted we are to have with us also Shannon Green. So Shannon is currently the director of the Human Rights Initiative at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. She has deep experience in international development, and before joining CSIS, Shannon was the senior director for global engagement on the national security staff, where she spearheaded the president's young leader initiatives around the world. So let me start with you, Shannon. Um, we have been inspired by these efforts and engagement, all different, um, all related uh, in many ways. Take us behind the curtain. Tell us what was the thinking uh, behind this uh, back when they started uh, and what they've set out to achieve. Great, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, I think when the president came into office, um, he did focus almost immediately on youth. And I think a lot of it is because who he is as a person and what he values. So given his background as a community organizer, he recognized the immense potential of youth and sort of acknowledged that the problems that we face in the global community have to be, um, have to be addressed with all hands on deck. This can't just be a matter where just governments are acting alone. So the president and his administration really sought to figure out how to partner with young people like those on this stage that have the creativity, the energy, the passion to solve the world's problems today. And rather than waiting for governments and sort of older generations to give them their turn, they could act now and sort of seize that opportunity and make a difference um, in the here and now. So the question for us really became then, how do you give young people who are already doing such great work and such inspiring work in their communities what we called a booster pack? So the tools, the training, the mentoring, the resources that they would need to make even more of a difference in their community. I think that really demonstrates you know, what the mentality was of the administration initially. Secondly, you have to recall that when the administration came in, U.S. credibility globally was at a significant um, low point. And so the question was also, how do we start to rebuild those relationships and those bridges and restore our credibility? And so the president sought to do so on the basis of mutual interest and mutual respect. So this meant really identifying areas where the U.S. had something of value to offer, but also that spoke to the needs and the desires of people internationally. So after having done you know, significant consultations and surveys and analysis, the administration determines that it should really play to its strengths and respond to the needs that youth all over the world were expressing. And so that really had to do with expanding educational opportunities and exchanges, supporting entrepreneurship and job creation, and promoting science, technology, and innovation. And I think the third reason, to be honest, is about our own self-interest and about our desire for peace and stability and security in the world. And Dana, as you mentioned, the Youth Bulge is a significant opportunity, but if young people aren't able to meet their aspirations, it could also be a real challenge. And so I think particularly on the issue of joblessness and unemployment, you know, the administration acknowledged that all of these young people weren't going to be able to be absorbed into the public sector or the private sector. So the question was how to spur opportunities that really give youth the ability to shape their own futures, to be in the driver's seat, and to have agency in creating those kinds of opportunities for themselves. And so for all those reasons, I think you saw a significant commitment in the early days and throughout the past eight years um, for youth and a real scaling up, as you guys have mentioned, of these kinds of youth leadership initiatives and opportunities. Right. 
So there's much to unpack in there, particularly the booster pack. Um, I was struck by uh, that toolkit of, of how we can help spur uh, the connections, the networks, and the like. Um, I think we'll come back to that. But Chris, I want to turn to you. Um, so, so many young people tell us that one of the biggest challenges they face is getting a seat at the table with that old, those old people, uh, <laughs> self included, generation of leaders. Uh, and that's true either in government or in the private sector. So you have an audience of proponents of youth. I'll take that liberty and say that. So how, from your perspective, can we help increase opportunities for youth participation? Have you experienced that? And what can we do about it? Mm. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge some of the older folk that get it. Um, <laughs> so like the president um, gets it and strive. <laughs> strive. <laughs> they get it. Shout out to strive. <laughs> was also investing um, and contributing towards the, this group of young African leaders. Um, I think at, 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 at the core of it was for us to realize the reality. Um, I speak for the continent when I say that we have the youngest population in the world of 70% mm -hmm. is youth. Mm -hmm. And when you have a stat statistic like that, and you're still having plans and frameworks being drawn for 50-year horizons, mm -hmm. exclusive of those, that group of people. Mm -hmm. You need to start asking some real questions. Mm -hmm. um, I find fundamental the problem is the youth being seen as a interested and affected party. Let's consult them on something mm -hmm. instead of being part of the organization, part of the roundtable discussion when we are saying, here's the administration. We're going to look at the initiatives for the next five years. Um, where's the youth voice in that, mm -hmm. uh, in that roundtable mm -hmm. discussion? Um, one of the robust debates actually at our regional conference was about the seat at the table. And um, some people were saying we need to create a table, some saying we need to justify why we need the seat at the table. But I think if you look at statistics, where you have a range of 50 to 60% of youth that are unemployed on the continent, and I come back to that 70% stat, of seven out of 10 people in Africa are youth. Mm -hmm. And then you come back to the stat that five to six of them are unemployed. Mm -hmm. We need to really question like where we where we tilting um, the growth of this continent or in the, and the globe as a, as a whole. Um, are we going to have a demographic dividend or are we going to have a demographic time bomb, which we are currently sitting on if this perpetuates as is mm -hmm. with the unemployment mm -hmm. figures that are there. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how do we address this, well, what, this initiative is one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Furtherance of this is to look at organizational structures, like how do we institutionally place youth there to make sure that the energy and innovation that comes from the youth, together with the wisdom of the old, we are able to address the problems. And then how do we um, create institutions, both in government and um, in terms of um, intergovernment institutions, for instance, the different, the AU, the EUs, how do you bring those to the table with the youth and when we speak and not be spoken at? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. So let me turn to Christiana. Um, uh, we've spoke of the institutions, the development efforts. You certainly committed your time and energy and talents to the development community in the world. What do you think the young leaders of today, how do you think that they will work on current and future priorities? How will your generation manage the development challenges in a different way? Um, where would you like to take your experience and leadership forward to address these set of issues? It's a great question. <laughs> There's a lot of aspects to answer that question, but I think um, as the common theme today would show, it needs to begin in collaboration. So speaking in terms of Let Girls Learn, I mean, this is an initiative that has come together by multiple agencies. And uh, that is something that I think is fairly new to international development in that it's not an in-agency initiative, it's a multi-agency initiative. Um, so because of that, youth are being spoken to and given opportunities at different levels, so policy, grassroots, and everything in between. Um, first, I would say to keep that up, and that will speak a lot to uh, different areas of the world, since how we need to address youth rising in the world differs on where it is. I can speak to Thailand personally in that uh, youth there have different struggles than they would on a different part in the world, right? So in Thailand specifically, um, we sought to promote girls since there was a huge gender equality gap. Um, and also focus on uh, health and basic needs first. From there, supporting youth by giving them opportunity to rise in, in places where they weren't normally being asked. So while I was in Peace Corps at, at uh, the headquarters building in Bangkok, two of my students were invited, a boy and a girl. 
and had never been outside of their village, um, let alone to the main, the main city of the country. Um, in fact, their homes are as big as most of our closets. So they were brought in to help reformat and, and uh, basically redo the framework of youth and development, which was a priority, one of the two priorities that our post had. Um, so they were brought in. They were not a part of the conversation. They were leading the conversation. Um, so if we continue to do things like that, that's how our leaders of the new generation, of Generation Now, are going to come up. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Mara, turning to you, so tell us from your experience, how have you seen donor support for entrepreneurs in the developing world change? Is it different today than it was in the past? Uh, and perhaps more importantly, where do you think it needs to go forward into the future? I think uh, donors are, are doing a great job helping entrepreneurs all over the world, like programs like DIV um, and the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. We didn't have those um, before the Obama administration. and. What's great about something like the Global Entrepreneurship Summit is a lot of social entrepreneurs, a lot of us are working in the trenches and kind of disconnected from each other. So it brings us all together and it's a great opportunity um, to network and make connections and brainstorm together on some of the critical social issues that we're targeting. And DIV is, is a great program that helps you um, prototype your, your model and scale because for social entrepreneurs it's sometimes um, more difficult for us to get investments. So um, even for, for our show in Egypt, USAID supported us because there's a big market, market gap in developing edutainment programs. Because edutainment programs, they cost more because you invest more in the design. And when you're trying to tackle a critical social issue, you're looking at the systemic problem. So you need to be able to, to, to bring different stakeholders together. And, and for us, what we did is we did a design lab where we'd bring in the private sector and the government and entrepreneurs to develop our model. And I think um, what we need to see more of is uh, for us, we are really lucky to get also donor support for monitoring and evaluation, but I think also monitoring what kind of impact you're having with um, your business. This is important, and I think a lot of entrepreneurs need support with this. We're, we're always focusing on our model and how we can improve it, and there's a lot of um, monitoring and evaluation tools that could help us, and if there is more support uh, with that. And in the Arab world, we have some amazing entrepreneurs. My favorite part of my job is, is traveling over the, all over the Middle East. And they're amazing entrepreneurs, and we have a booming ecosystem. And I think what, what we need is more, um, more funding to be able to test our models, and we can learn a little bit more from uh, foundations that are a little bit flexible with their funding because an, as an entrepreneur you're kind of flying that plane and building it at the same time so you need to have a donor that um, is willing to invest and take um, risks with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we've had a number of ideas come out. The, the importance of um, investment that is flexible, um, that looks at the uh, risk profile and that has an M&E framework that suits what the investment is. Um, the larger institutions on the continent in Africa um, and how they adapt to uh, the affected voice of youth. Uh, and then collaboration being at the heart of all of it. Um, I think these are probably components of the booster pack uh, that you were envisioning, Shannon. But let me toss it back to you uh, for your reflections on how these issues particularly play out in the programs. Um, and then to lift up a little bit into what's the policy environment that is needed and helpful to foster all of this? Yep. I mean, I think all of these are components of the booster pack. The one thing I would suggest is missing is the continuity and depth of the engagement. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we found when we were thinking about these youth initiatives was how to build something where there was a consistent ongoing engagement and support for participants, acknowledging that when people get training or they get a grant or they have contact with the US government, they might be really inspired and ready to go conquer the world. But then they go back to their, you know, their home countries, they go back to their home institutions, and they encounter all sorts of obstacles. So a lot of these initiatives were built in mind of this you know, continuity of engagement. So YALI is a good example where you have this intensive engagement here in the United States through the 
um, workshops that are happening at the universities, and that's an educational component and a training component. But then when people go back home, rather than just saying, okay, great, you learned a lot, you know, go and implement your ideas, when they get back home, they continue to have this support and engagement with the US government. So there's access to internships and mentorships. So when people have a hard day, they have somebody that they can turn to. Um, there's now a 250,000 person strong Yali network. So they're connected to each other across sectors, across borders, and they can support each other and give each other ideas and some motivation when you encounter those hard times. And there's the regular contact with the embassies um, through the youth councils and other opportunities that ambassadors would take to continue to cultivate this relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to think about these efforts as not just being a one-off, but about being a real investment in relationships over time, and mm -hmm. that being really important. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, Dana, that you're touching on is it's not just about the individual investment and folks like the ones that we have on this stage, but you also have to address what is happening in the policy environment or in the enabling environment that's either gonna help or hurt their chances of success when they get back home. And this was particularly salient for entrepreneurship efforts where some countries it's extremely problematic or risky to be an entrepreneur because it's a criminal offense if you take a loan and you fail and aren't being able to pay it back. So there also has to be an investment in improving the enabling environment so when people have the will and they have the way, they actually have a context in which they can put those ideas into practice. Terrific. So I think we might be finding the clock just a bit. Um, I know that there have been many questions submitted through Facebook, so I wanted to um, uh, take one of those uh, and open it up to the panel just uh, to contribute to. So faith, Facebook uh, listeners are asking, how can youth leaders around the world ensure that efforts are inclusive so that the voice of women and minorities and marginalized groups are included? Anyone want to take that one to start? <laughs> Chris! <laughs> um, I think I can speak for, for, for the Yali Network. Um, we've, we've, there have been very creative ways at how we um, sort of been roped into initiatives or drove, driven initiatives that are you know, part of the Yali Network, but actually really global in, in, in essence. One of those is Africa for Her, and one of those is Yali Learns. Mm. Um, and the other one is on climate change. So that's just one, there was one method of how technology um, was, was really a way of honing in people, whether it was through a pledge or whether it was through continual engagement or Twitter conversations to really get people to start thinking around these issues which are not just um, global in essence, but they're also um, country specific or in our communities, they're relevant. Um, I think the, the, a, a powerful mechanism tool is really to look at like how, the, the, how technology can be used, right? Mm -hmm. But that, that's one avenue. The other avenue is to really, if you look at the, the, the groups that are really driving different campaigns, you know, um, all around the world where it's really youths at the heart of it. And if the support could come and be honed in for such movements, whether it's a movement, whether it's a campaign that's really standing for, whether it's an injustice or inequality that's being addressed, um, that's been one powerful way um, of doing it. Mm -hmm. But also I think, like the Open Government Partnership, if you have more, more of that platform with governments where they also have an open ear mm -hmm. to come into the party and really collaborate with the youth, with the um, civic um, society, you can really affect more um, change for, especially for the marginalized groups and different issues that we seek to tackle. Terrific, thank you. Mm -hmm. Shannon. Yeah, I think one thing that's been really innovative about some of these approaches um, was an effort to think about what are the skills and the basic qualifications that an individual needs to qualify for some of these more intensive programs and engagement? So there was a whole of effort, um, effort, whole of government effort um, to make sure that individuals who lived in rural areas, um, people who were marginalized, people who ne didn't necessarily have the English language skills that they needed to participate in YALI or in an educational exchange program were reached out to by the US government and were able to start getting the skills that they needed to move up the ladder and ultimately qualify someday for those kinds of programs. So for example, Peace Corps does a lot of English language education. So they would start to work with people at a local level 
to help them get the skills they would need to eventually qualify for some of these other, other efforts. So really thinking about it as a spectrum of engagement or as a ladder, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and recognizing that different parts of the US government have reached into different communities and can help move people up that ladder if we were coordinated enough to think about it in that fashion. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Christiana? So I think it's important to not um, reformat youth ideas into old framework and as as change makers, we can help them do that. And the, some of the most inspiring causes that I saw in my time abroad um, in Thailand was the initiatives that were youth-led, supporting youth. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, so much creativity was opened up. Um, so the, that's my two cents about that. Terrific, mm -hmm. thank you, thank you. Great, so I think we're down to our last two minutes. Um, let's see, you have quite an influential audience uh, that we're all looking out upon. Um, tell us in just 30 seconds, what should we collectively be doing more of? What shouldn't we be doing? Uh, and what is your greatest cause for optimism, for hope? We'll start with you. Oop. Okay. <laughs> no, should we start um, with Shannon? No, we can start, it's okay. <laughs> I think um, have no shame. Do what you really, um, what you really believe in. I think we all get caught up in our nine to five jobs and we forget about what our dreams were when we were young. Um, what, what are the things that you wanna accomplish in this life? And I think you really have to keep your dreams alive. And it's, it's really hard to do that when we're all busy with our jobs and especially as entrepreneurs where it's no longer a nine to five for us. It's like, I don't know what it is for us, but it's, it's a long day. So. Um, yeah, have no shame and keep your dreams alive. Terrific, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, that deserves a round, right? Chris? Um, okay, a couple of things. One, to the youth, remain as radical as you are and keep pushing. Um, <laughs> two, to, to, to the organizational capacity, different institutions. Um, let's move away from the fear of these radical ideas that the youth is coming with and actually like try them out, give them an ear, bring them to the table and actually try maybe a walking meeting then instead of sitting in a boardroom and boring them <coughs> to death. Um, but like let's just really be open to what the youth has to bring to the table and some really um, innovative ways of um, doing the same work and probably being better at it. And then lastly, um, to the incoming president, um, whoever she is, please keep the... <laughs> please keep the initiatives going and, 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 and remain your commitment to the youth around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christiana. So lastly, I would encourage those in this room who are associated mostly with policy and engaging generation now to move to grassroots a bit and those in grassroots to move back to policy a bit so that we can understand each other better. Um, my optimism is that it seems to me that we are experiencing a social shift in equality and interconnectedness and I couldn't be happier. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. <clears throat> Shannon. Great, last word. Um, I would just say to policymakers and donors to live by the mantra, never for you, without you. Meaning, if you're going to be developing a youth initiative or a youth program, make sure that you're talking to youth because as the older generation, I don't know what's in these young people's minds and I might think that I have the most brilliant ideas about what they want, but in reality, it might be really disconnected from what is going on in their lives. So I would say, make sure that you're talking to the individuals and really listening to the individuals that you're trying to support. Terrific, so I have, everyone has their pens out. Have no shame, remain radical, move to the grassroots, and never for you without you. Please join me in thanking this phenomenal talk. <laughs>